Welcome to this episode of Clinically Pressed. We have a follow-up episode with Dr. Sean Gallagher of Gallagher Performance, and in this one we talk specifically hockey training. Uh, we dive deep into the woods on it and some of the different things that Sean does with training uh, hockey players and some of the challenges that come along with it with having younger athletes and not exactly having one defined season but actually having multiple and what that means in terms of training them. Also, we dive into the uniqueness of his practice in terms of the treatment, the care, the rehabilitation, and driving right into performance training. So if you do anything with hockey and training and everything like that, we highly recommend that you check this episode out. Such a great resource. Um, we recommend you give them a follow, too, on Gallagher Performances. They've always got some sort of training thing to follow and take a look at. While we're on training, got to recover. We talk Paragon supplements. Please check them out. Their night gains is off the chart in terms of what it can do for you to help you recover, whether it's for being an everyday athlete or getting into training at an extremely high level. So give those guys a look and use promo code CP15 for 15% off at checkout. If you listen to us on iTunes, please just scroll down a little bit off of our main page. Hit a five-star review. It truly does help us bump up the rankings and get to more people. Enjoy the episode. Just jump right in, I guess. Uh, Go for it. Little, little introduction again, uh, Dr. Sean Gallagher, uh, Gallagher Performance. And uh, we're following up because we did episode one. Uh, when was that released? About, about, a, about a year ago? I don't know, somewhere somewhere in the mix. I think it was right. in the 30s, episode 30s or so. But uh, it's always good talking with Dr. Gallagher, and he served as a mentor to me. And um, it's it's nice to talk to you. And, yeah, it's good to be back, boys. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess kind of getting into things, um, it sounds like you're really doing well in practice and um, busy and things are taking off uh, in a, a good way for you. So um, I guess one of the things that we had mentioned talking to you about, kind of picking your brain and how you kind of combine like the clinical aspect of your patient care with the, the performance side of your practice as well, because I know that's kind of like your niche. Yeah. So I, I, I think um, in the two years since we've been here, um, basically when we talked last, we had been probably about nine months into our new location. Um, and so this month, that marks two years since we've been here. And uh, if you look at like kind of at least the demographic where we are in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh, um, you're, there aren't, and I guess you could say this uh, across the board, there aren't many rehab facilities that you see that also will integrate in performance training under one roof. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're around there, but uh, I, found, I think from an accessibility standpoint, um, I mean, at least in, in Pittsburgh area, you have, uh, a lot of that in this, like in the city, um, but suburbs kind of it's hit and miss. So we built quite um, quite a large client base uh, on that alone um, because it it allows for this fairly seamless transition from you know as you said like the rehab back into this integration of performance based training, which you know I feel like. Uh, some fairly uh, smart people out there, you know, people that I've learned from, and I'm sure you guys uh, have learned from as well. Um, you know, they talk about rehab and the performance training existing sort of on a spectrum, right? And it's as, as you take someone through those early phases of rehab, essentially is what you're doing is you're trying to take their body to higher and higher levels of function, you know, and ultimately 
whatever they're trying to return to becomes their, um, you know, point at which, if you will, uh, goal of return, right? So it's like if I'm dealing with a hockey player, it's totally different, and I'm not just trying to get someone back to everyday tasks, you know, mm-hmm. with with very minimal pain and lim- limitation. Um, and I, I think most physical therapy offices, rehab offices in this area, you know, may, maybe the heaviest weights that they'll those people will encounter uh, are like you know med balls, kettlebells, dumbbells, like up to 10, 15 pounds, right? Maybe some bands, maybe there's some uh, unstable training that they do, but there isn't a huge emphasis on, on strength and then movement dynamics as it corresponds, especially to sport. So when we have 1,100 square feet in the back, that's pretty much dedicated to that. Um, it's fairly easy to jump into that. You know, I, uh, I, as well as my brother, have worked with a lot of kids that uh, have have played or are currently playing collegiate sports. And even in their training centers, at least in it, whether it's the athletic therapy room or the physical therapy room, um, it's like it's all separated. It's like they work with the training staff and then and then it's like, OK, the strength and conditioning staff. And maybe there's not a whole lot of correspondence between the two. Maybe a little. I mean, it kind of, it kind of depends on the level whether it's like D3 or D1. Um, and and so when they're here with us, what they like is we're kind of like on the same page in that sense. So mm-hmm. there's a little bit more of that like day-to-day oversight. Um, we can make better judgment calls of, hey, we might need to regress today or, hey, you know, we're really seeing some steady improvement. So let's, let's step it up. Um, but for those reasons, uh, we 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 get we get a lot of business for that, especially from uh, from area athletes. It's awesome. That, I mean, in everything that you, you have in your background, it's nice that you're able to apply that, you know, in that setting too. Well, I mean, that's why. What at least with the residencies, you know, I went through like I, I put so much emphasis into learning as much as I could about strength training and it was just uh i mean again my major was in exercise science and i could have gone through the strength and conditioning route um but i had other interests you know in in chiropractic but ultimately i wanted to bring them both together and i I think it really serves uh therapists well when you know especially if they're very hands-on with uh patients in terms of uh rehabilitative exercise if they understand strength programming if they understand great exercise selections and they have a huge library that they can pull from otherwise you become really dependent on those like classic orthopedic rehabilitative manuals you know that set out like week by week and they give you timelines and and some of that stuff's kind of unrealistic you know some might serve someone well you might have someone that's way ahead of schedule or you know I, i got a kid that's back from mercyhurst who plays college hockey there and he's rehabbing an ankle sprain high ankle sprain and has spent largely four weeks on a therapy table you know and while there's some value to that um you know he he, arguably he's probably behind in his in his rehab and it's you know maybe maybe they get a little gun shy but uh, you know it's like if, if you can get get them up as we know by sport uh if they become deconditioned, that becomes a complicating factor in their own rehab progress, especially as you tra- uh, transfer them or progress them through that uh, more performance side of things for return to play. Um, so it's trying to figure out at what at what point, you know, do we start to uh, integrate that stuff in? And then basically uh, what we find is, as Craig Levinson talks a lot about, it's just graded exposure. Um, and, and so it's basically kind of we work off of it. It's, you know, you work kind of those early phases of rehab. And from that standpoint, then it's just graded exposure to higher and higher levels of functional, quote, training or performance based training to ultimately meet their goals. Uh, whether it's, yeah, like I said, especially in these in the context we're talking about, more specifically to like return to sport. Sure. So then, um, 
do you use specific techniques uh, for different sports or are you just kind of applying the same principles of strength, you know, speed, agility, athleticism across? Oh, yeah. The apply that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, arguably for most, uh, most sport, like team sport athletes, the weight room and that stuff becomes uh, essentially you could consider general physical preparation, right? It's not terribly specific to their sport. I mean, if I was talking about, we're talking a CrossFitter, an Olympic weightlifter, a powerlifter, then weight room stuff becomes much more highly specific to their craft, right? So you got to look at it on kind of scale of sport mastery where the weight room largely becomes how do we train gross movement patterns? You know, how do we fine tune those? You know, if we're looking for improved hip extension, you know, whether it's rotational qualities in the hip, the torso, um, how, how do they transfer load in their body, you know, pulling, pressing. I mean, you basically can start to categorize general movement patterns as a lot of people do push, pull, squat, lunge, hinge, carries, you know, um, you know, finding the deficiencies that they have. How are we going to address that um, in the weight room? And then all those number of variables that come along with that, uh, whether it's the exercises you select and the, the tempo which they perform it, <clears throat> sets, reps, rest periods, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we're talking about in the context of hockey, I mean, the most specific thing that those players will do is on the ice and, and you tear it down from there. Um, and anything you can do off the ice, ultimately you hope will transfer on the ice. And there's limited transferability, you know. Um, <clears throat> if I have someone that's simply riding a bike, that's great. Like we might have to start there, but um, the bike isn't going to prepare him for hockey. I mean, it might give him some general aerobic base, lactate threshold training. Uh, if we're trying to re-educate quads or get some quad strength back, um, great way to do it but you know we might want to ultimately try to get them to a point where maybe we can do some more lateral based work whether it's slide board <clears throat> um we have a piece of machinery here it's called the skier's edge that um we love our hockey players love and it's been huge i mean i've gotten more i mean this kind of thing i've got more skiing clients now <laughs> <laughs> because of it, whether they're rehabilitative or they're looking for performance-based training, because we got their um, World Cup World Cup plyometric power model, uh, so it's their highest end model, uh, and I find that it it, it trains that uh, <clears throat> that lateral movement and power really really well, um, and it it gives a great uh, specific. Now, if you will, if you look at the, the biodynamic structure of skating, we can put someone on there. You know, if we can get someone doing intervals on that, they're, they're going to be far better served doing that than any bike work or even a treadmill or outdoor running. Sure. So, so, you know, we, we, can, we can look at it in the context of <laughs> the, bio, you know, the biodynamics that you see relative to the sport, in different joint angles. Um, and then we might even base our, our exercise selection off that, you know, when we see kids doing lunges and split squats, you now we might be looking at more of a positive shin angle rather than a, a, a very vertical or perpendicular shin angle, because that's not, that's not sport, you know, that's not acceleration. Uh, we want to see that ability and, and depending on someone's range of motion that, I mean, some of these kids we work with that are hockey players, they they have very, tight ankles um but you'd be surprised at the amount of closed chain dorsiflexion that they can get you know you can motion their ankles like open chain and it's not that great but you get them doing uh skater squats split squats stuff like that and they're they're no their their knees are coming way forward over the toes they got this beautiful like shin angle some of some hockey players you can see i mean they have massive amount of meat over their quad kneecaps quads mm -hmm. such as such a quad dominant activity um which unfortunately in some in, in some realms of training i mean 
there's almost too much emphasis given to the posterior chain. Mm -hmm. I mean, rightly so. I mean, the posterior chain, just about anybody that walks in our door, we can guarantee there's going to be posterior chain deficiencies. <clears throat> you know, uh, so we don't spend a whole lot of time doing like selective functional movement assessments and stuff like that. It's almost a given, especially with the adolescent population. Some of them have no clue how to hinge, mm -hmm. you know. So you will work that. Um, but we also aren't going to shy away from from very quad dominant work either, you know, especially in the hockey population because it's so critical to their performance. Hmm. Yeah. So you talked about, um, you know, finding these deficiencies and, you know, working on their deficiencies. And then you mentioned that you won't spend a lot of time screening them out because you can pretty much, you know, know what you're dealing with there. So what are the, I guess, the ways that you find, uh, individual deficiencies and uh, apply that, I guess. Yeah. Um, I, it, for me, I mean, it, it's kind of the, the, you know, what's they call the, you, you know, whether you call it your clinical eye or your, you know, coach's eye, yep. um, you just know when you know, you see it. Like I love what um, Buddy Morris always says. And if, for those that don't know who Buddy Morris is, I, I, I don't know. I've lost kind of track, but, I think he might be still with the Arizona Cardinals of the NFL. Yeah. But he usually says, because he's not big on those the screens. I mean, he sees the he sees the purpose in them, but he's just like, watch your athletes move, watch them warm up. It's like you learn a lot just by watching them move because you see you see habits. If you put them in a constraint, you don't always see habits. Right? Like they might start to pick up what they're trying to look at right but if you just watch them do what they do naturally you'll see more of their tendencies just by studying and one and that's the luxury of having what we have because we can really stand back and watch a move versus like if i have them in my in my office on the table you know we're interacting you don't really see that a whole lot but if we watch athletes move and like you can learn a lot about them in, in, over a few weeks you know you don't necessarily pick up on everything right away um but it's you give them you know exposure to different exercises you give them you know exposure to different loads or speed of movement and how things can change just relative to that right it's like you might see something pop out to you if they're doing a a lunge series as a warm up you know or they might look pretty good but all of a sudden you put them you put them into a split squad or maybe like some sort of suspension training system and have them do a, a a reverse lunge and wow like you really see stuff come out and you might see them problem solving and i think there's one of the things that i'm i'm big on uh sometimes kids are just simply uncoordinated and it's not to be insulting but sometimes you have them do stuff they're uncoordinated they just need time with it you know, they, they got to figure it out. And it's like I watch my nieces and nephews. You know, no one really babies uh, a baby developing. You know what I mean? Like, oh, no, 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 no. You, you, want, like, you know, they. how many times you watch little kids, like, take tumbles? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's like you just – you let them figure it out. Like, obviously, you're not going to put them in a situation that's dangerous. Like, if they're getting close to stairs – <laughs> you know, obviously you're going to use common sense but in the same thing here it's like sometimes we got to let them figure it out you know and whether maybe you use different tactics whether it's external cueing through like bands or whatnot that come more reactive neuromuscular training or you actually give them verbal cues and try to trigger some sort of imagery in their head whatever starts to work for them to ingrain that yeah, but uh, a lot of it, in my opinion, is we're we're simply dealing with, in many respects, people that are uncoordinated. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, it's just hey, at a certain point, your body's going to catch on, which I think is when we when we slow things down and we a lot of our exercise selection, we incorporate eccentric and isometrics into. The, into the exercise uh, execution, you know, not necessarily. I know we talked last time about Cal Dietz and you know, obviously he's big on tri-basic training and why I think there's value in there. I don't, I, I think 
rather than isolating out an eccentric phase, an isometric phase, and a concentric phase, it's like how the NSCA traditionally did their blocks of programming. You, you, they did hypertrophy, they did strength, and they did power. And then you looked at Eastern European methods and Soviet methods, and they were training all those attributes in one training cycle. They didn't necessarily isolate out hypertrophy, strength, and power, because while on paper it may sound good, it, 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 it fails against a model that in integrates it all into one program, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're never really going a large period of time where there aren't eccentrics and isometrics integrated in. I mean, it, it's almost always there because isometrics, honestly, they make you think. I mean, there's such, there, there, there's this tremendous neural flow in the body that you can capitalize on by helping someone own a position, own a posture, feel how they're loading, you know, obviously. And then we like to let them do it wrong and then show them, show them a better way. So then they can problem solve with it. But um, I think when we do that, um, we start to see an, an increase in quote, that coordination that sometimes when you're seeing their habits and you're seeing the movements that they do, I think that has a, I think that has a lot greater success than sometimes trying to follow an, an algorithm because I think it's too confined. You know, I, I think coaches, really good coaches are highly adaptable, not only with what they do day to day. And it's like if you plan something and then scrapping it or just like, hey, if someone's not getting it, how are you going to how are you going to make a change on the fly to help help it start clicking? You know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I can see, like, with going back to the, the screens and stuff, like, it's nice in that setting that you have to be able to, you know, just just be able to watch them move. Yeah. On a smaller scale basis. And, you know, some of the, the places that are using screens, they're trying to get through a large, you know, maybe a, a whole team at a time or something. Yeah. And I think you got to, I think you touched on a great point, Kyle, because it's all, I think it's, it's practitioner dependent it's coach dependent you know we're we're one-on-one -on -one or very small group we can give very hands-on detailed eye like you know if i if i had 20 30 kids at a time like i do in the summer um i mean it's really tough when i'm when i'm working with the local high school's hockey team and i run their strength and conditioning program it's extremely difficult you know i i will i'll keep my eye on you know, a couple of kids and then like, I'll see stuff and workshop with them. I'll try to get around to everybody, but you can't see everything, you know? So I think when you have systems in place, your systems will best suit uh, the environment you're working in. And so when we can be very eyes on with their kids, we're not so dependent on, you know, a certain like uh, movement screening system, you know, like we'll use stuff. It's like, we want to see kids squat. You know, we want to see kids do, you know, like lunge and single leg stand and how do you hop on one leg and, you know, how do you hold this position after whether it's a plank or a stability buttress or something like a bird dog, you know, how, how, what do they do, you know, in those environments, but it's sometimes just putting them into it. And then, you know, obviously seeing, seeing what you see and just trying to work with it. Um, and we can do we have that luxury in our model because that's what we we decided to do mm -hmm. yeah but so, yeah, great point and uh um you know working with their deficiencies and building those up and obviously making them more well-rounded do you um, is that more of your emphasis then is on their deficiencies or say they're they have a you know particular strength do yeah. you try to you know even let them develop that even further yeah, well, I think I think efficiency becomes the, the biggest thing, you know, like we don't want to be so clinically enamored with like being super efficient, super perfect. Like we want we want better, you know, and arguably like, you know, that that degree of efficiency that any individual has, uh, you, you could you could chase that through your entire career. I mean, look at what pro athletes do, pro golfers and so on. I mean, they're always trying to fine tune. 
Mm-hmm. When you hear about pro golfers switching coaches and stuff like that all the time, you know. Um, so that's an ongoing process. But when we're dealing with some of these adolescent athletes that are like pretty uncoordinated, if you will, I mean, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna chase down efficiency first before we start chasing down load because that efficiency will drive strength in and of itself. Sure. Um, It'll help drive speed. The other thing I like uh, to keep in mind, is especially with these, uh, with most athletes, not just saying that our adolescent athletes, is speed will drive strength. Strength doesn't always drive speed. Hmm. I mean, because we, we can have these kids that can go a long period of time without touching weights, soccer players, basketball, hockey, and they don't have a huge drop off in their strength levels uh for months you know they they might have maybe a 10 percent, 15 percent drop off sometimes in their three to five rep max testing that we do whether it's squat trap bar or uh lunge work it's because they're they're neuro, from a neuromuscular standpoint they're holding on to a very strong stimulus through sprinting through jumping and so on you know um, now, maybe their work capacity in the weight room is taking a hit. Like if you did very voluminous training with them, it'd probably crush them, yeah. right? But their their strength output or their power output hasn't significantly dropped off in a lot of cases, right? Um, where like I, I know some power lifters have seen them, you know, guys have huge numbers. You put a 24-inch box in front of them, it freaks them out about trying to jump up on it, right? Or you know, you can take guys that squat seven, eight, nine hundred pounds, and it doesn't mean they're going to be blazing the track either. You know, and just like you know, like a kid that's got really great speed and maybe can jump out of the building doesn't mean that they're going to squat five hundred pounds. But for the most part, a lot of your, a lot of your stronger kids, you know, like if you, relative to body weight, you know, and strength ratios. Their, their strength levels are pretty good if they're, uh, I, you know, what we find is if their speed and their power output from a jumping ability is impressive, you know. So if we can work on efficiency with them, and those means it's like efficiency will drive strength. So a lot of times the deficiencies are just, we would just try to make them more efficient as they, you see efficiency, strength builds, right? Um but you know, a lot of a lot of high end athletes are kind of mediocre in the strength world, or by strength standards. So we don't put a huge emphasis on strength. Like we want them to get stronger. Don't get me wrong. Some of our kids are really strong. Um, but at what point does it become? Is there you know diminishing return on it? Is another thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like we can get them really strong, but. <clears throat> We'll want to make sure that they're staying efficient and their speed and their power output is on point for um, for their sport demand, right? I mean, so a lot of kids that we work with don't necessarily have, like I said, super impressive squat, bench, or deadlift numbers, right? But they routinely get faster. They routinely jump higher or further. And it's largely because they're just getting <clears> – <throat> they're getting more efficient on a neuromuscular level, right? And as you guys know, cause you spend time in the weight room, I mean, especially if you're incorporating an eccentric or an isometric tempo into the, your exercise, <clears throat> you're, not, you're not lifting a ton of weight with it cause your time under tension is significantly increased, right? Uh, so that said, you might not have a tremendous amount of weight on the bar, but the neurological demand is through the roof sometimes. Or, of course, there's a reality if we use submaximal weights and use a lot of force production, you might get far more out of that than a heavier load ex- executed at a slower speed. <clears throat> and it may uh, it may alter the dynamics of their movement to the point to the point where it might be detrimental to the patterning that you really want to see for transfer into sport. You know, we're really loading up a deadlift, and someone's not see we're not getting that crisp initiation of hip extension that we want then what's the point you know so it's like you gotta we watch for that stuff during the workout you know and if we're seeing if we're seeing that change then we're dropping the load 
you know, that's, that's a movement necessity in itself. It's people say it all the time. Every exercise is a test. So when you really have the luxury of watching athletes like we do, then it's, you can see stuff and then you can make those in-game adjustments during their training session and not, not in a way be solely relying on what you saw in some sort of baseline assessment. That's really interesting. Yeah. So do you, with the, the concentric, eccentric and that type of work, um, or maybe you don't even care about it, but um, yeah. you see less of a, a plateau than if there wasn't as much of an emphasis, or are you not even really concerned because you're looking more at a performance side of things? Um, it, well, it all depends. I mean, like, you know, if we're looking at, all right, let's talk in the context of hockey. You know, one of the most coveted things on ice is acceleration, right? I mean, the game, because of the way it's changed, it's, it's a faster game now than it, than it had been, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So a huge emphasis on skating ability, you know, if, regardless of the size of the player, if you got speed, you're going to be a successful player. Um, but hockey, hockey is a small area game, you know, it's loose puck battles. And if, if you can't win the puck battles, it, arguably your team's kind of playing in a hole, so to speak. So acceleration is critically important. And one of the best ways to train, um, acceleration abilities is what they would consider static overcome by dynamic systems you know something like box squats deadlifts um you know bottoms up type skater squats where you're in a literally a static position how quickly can you get out of that right um so you know that's what we'll use if we're talking purely like concentric based right that's a lot of times what acceleration is, you know, or we'll incorporate some isometrics into it um, to help initiate a little bit larger sense of activation in the body and coordination, how to, how to load, how to sense how to load and not only just load, whether it's the legs, but how to create tension and resistance, certain areas of the body. So you're more streamlined, more efficient, um, whether we use bands, um, or, you know, like we have that Cairo core vest we'll use. If you guys have ever seen that, I'd look into it. But it's basically, a, it's like a vest that's got different loops and carabiners on it. And you can create different oblique sling resistances, whether through cables or bands. Um, and so they, they have to become a lot more, re, uh, a lot more resilient against uh, those energy leaks, if you will, sure. um, through their torso. Um, and, uh, you know, so from an acceleration standpoint, you don't see a whole lot of eccentric stress coming in the body. Um, but you know, as, as the more reactive an athlete gets, as they re start to reach top end speed, um, we have that. So, you know, we, we will do a lot of, you know, uh, bounds or jumps in series, um, to work more top, top end speed. And, and try to help train that elastic like stretch reflex in the muscular system. Um, and obviously to, to build that type of eccentric capacity, whether it's in the hamstrings or, you know, calves, Achilles, you know, wherever you have to start, you have to start, you know, it might be as simple as just doing some basic eccentrics with them through calves, hamstrings, you know, bridge walkouts, sliders, um things like that and then of course lunges squats anything where you can slow that tempo down to build build some eccentric strength so that when they get into more dynamic uh and higher impact activities that hopefully again they're resilient enough to withstand that because you could break it down it's like you think of performance training your big three goals are one you don't want injuries during the training session or during the training plan Two, you want to make the body resilient enough against injuries that can occur in in season or in competitive sport. And three, obviously, it's it's the performance side of things. Whether they're looking for size, strength, um, speed, right? So, I mean, those are your big three. So, anything you can do to incorporate, um, I, I think those things like uh, the the different loading parameters and folks on eccentrics, isometrics especially I think go a long way in making uh, tissue in the body a lot more resilient to the stresses that they're going to meet. And then also 
neurologically how how the brain can start to uh, better integrate those strategies in. So when they encounter that stuff or different perturbations or unexpected, you know, whether it's contact, this and that, that they might be able to uh, right themselves before they get to a barrier, which maybe an injury does occur. Mm -hmm. Sure. <clears throat> so you talked about the, you know, the importance of uh, some of these uh, applications in the, the weight room or, you know, the training purposes. How would you recommend they balance that between on ice skating because obviously that's the application that they're yeah going to put forth yeah what do you recommend there uh great question i mean i guess it's it depends on the the calendar year i mean i think it's valuable for any athlete especially at a young age to take time away from sport um play other sports just it's healthy get a break mentally physically so if they're in their off season i mean a lot of the a lot of the uh strength and conditioning stuff can take more of a primary focus um so whether they're doing two three day a week or if, you know if the kids got a lot of drive you might be doing things most days of the week um and just you know trying to manage that training load depending on how frequently they're training and uh and then everything else that they're doing um yeah, that's that's the that's the one thing that we find is increasingly challenging with the sport of hockey because, like most sports, they seem to be run a good chunk of the calendar year, and there's less and less time away that these kids can get some real dedicated time to strength and conditioning that would help them up their physical abilities to take their skating abilities and on ice abilities to another level, right? In season, it gets to be really tough because now, as we talked about, you know, the most specific thing those kids will ever do is stuff on ice, and that that take precedence. So we got to manage their stresses off the ice very well. You know, we try not to make the kids too sore. You know, so you know overall training volume is managed because uh, we don't want a lot of DOMs settling in. We don't typically introduce unfamiliar exercises during the during in season because that can have those ramifications make a kid sore or we might we might create more higher levels of fatigue um whether it's uh metabolic or, or or neural fatigue that will have a negative consequence to sport practice and for a lot of these kids if they look like crap in practice they might not play that much in the game so you know depending on how frequently they're practicing we got to understand that Hey, everything we're doing here, we want you feeling good on the ice, and, and that's it. You know, because if coach doesn't like the way you look, that might have a negative impact on your playing time. Um, so yeah, I mean, we'll 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 still focus in on um, some plyometric ability, uh, but not a ton because they're getting a lot of that with their on ice work. They're getting a lot of their quote conditioning and aerobic based training from practice. So we don't have to hammer that, or we shouldn't have to hammer that too hard in season. Um, so, you know, we'll focus on maintaining general strength levels, um, doing things just to kind of keep their body fine-tuned and, and balanced. Because, I mean, in a way, there's a lot of asymmetries in the body that develop due to sport. And, and you'll see that with hockey players at time because of, in a way, how unnatural the sport of hockey is. But we can't necessarily rob them of those asymmetries that develop because those asymmetries have a lot to do with what makes them good. Sure. You know, but what we got to do is we got to manage them well to the point where they don't become clinically significant, where they become pain patients. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't necessarily want to rob them of that stuff, but we also don't want them on, on the therapy table either. So, okay, what can we do to help offset some of the stresses that? that skating <clears throat> and playing a contacts collision sport have, you know, well, we want to keep the shoulders healthy. Um, probably not going to do a ton of loading, unnecessary loading on the elbows and the forearms and stuff like that. Um, so that's why like, we're not real big on the Olympic lifts here with a lot of our athletes. Cause it's sometimes it puts too much strain on, on joints that already taken a good beating, you know, but, 
through through sled pushes, jumps, stuff like that, we can still train uh, a high neural output power aspect with minimal stress on certain joints. Um, and so we'll try to manage that in season. Like I said, you know, we'll try to keep the athletes reasonably strong, um, train a, a, a wide range of those movement patterns, you know, different lunge varieties, step ups. Like we like to use the uh, sliders or slide boards, right? Um, with lateral lunges. Um, I mean, they're usually they can be pretty bound up in their hips. So, you know, if we're anything we can do to create a, uh, create in a way uh, an environment where they're they're getting a good training training stimulus, but uh, they're walking out the door maybe feeling better than when they walk in. That's a that's a good rule of thumb we like to work with in season because uh, we don't want to, like I said, too overly fatigued or beat up. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the hockey guys and the girls that we work with all tend to do pretty well with um, low low volume training in season because a lot of them play three or four games on the weekend. Um, they have two to three practices during the week. It's a lot, you know. So, yeah, we're, we're not we're, – we're, not doing a lot of exhaustive training. It's almost like we're just trying to get them ready for the next go. Sure. Yeah. So another question regarding uh, what you started with is because um, it, there's some controversy from what I've seen in the, the hockey world in the limited exposure that I've had to it is you, and I think this applies to other sports as well, but you've got like one side that says, okay, you've got your, your in season, and you shouldn't do any, like, like you mentioned, playing multiple sports and all that stuff. Like you shouldn't do anything of that sport outside of the season. And then yeah. the other side of it that says, you know, as much as you can, just go for it. And you, you can play pretty much any sport year round now. And then there's kind of like a, maybe a, a middle ground there of, okay, maybe you can play in season and you're getting your exposure and then maybe you throw in you know, a couple of camps or something. And maybe especially for hockey with, like you said, as specific as that skill is, you can't really get that on dry land. So no. you want to try to, you know, mix in a couple camps or skating sessions periodically throughout the off season just to kind of maintain some of those skills. What's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, um, I think a lot of times it becomes dependent upon the kid, you know, uh, if they need a lot of work on their skating, I mean, you're probably not going to want to go a big chunk of the year without being on the ice. I mean, that's that's arguably, in my opinion, the most valuable skill as a hockey player is being an efficient skater, being good on your edges. Um, and some kids are just blessed with the ability to pick that stuff up quicker than others. And so if someone's kind of a slow developer when it comes to skating ability, the might have to put in some extra effort there. Um, and, and maybe they can't go three, four months uh, of the year without being on the ice. It might put them behind. Um, other kids, you know, they might need to work on their, their hands, you know, so maybe at home they're doing stuff with, um, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can stick handle with now. I mean, they've got like this thing called the green biscuit that literally slides on any surface you know, and these different contraptions that you can use at home to work on uh, evasive maneuvers and stick handling and tight areas, working on the quickness of your hand. You know, some kids might shoot pucks um, to work on shot accuracy. So it's like you need that. But I think, um, I think any athlete is well served if they play a, a, a number of different sports. I think it's healthy for them physically. You know, remove some repetitive stresses from the body um, that may ultimately enable them if they are playing longer, um, they might they might have less injury down the road. I mean, they've, they've done studies on that in East Germany and I think in the Soviet Union where some of these kids that are specialized early while they developed quicker, once they got into adolescence, they actually had 
more frequent overuse injuries and they were more likely to burn out and quit the sport. Whereas kids that specialize later, they didn't have as much injury because there wasn't as much force adaptation on their body and their joints. Um, they kind of quote, as they kind of often say, quote, kind of came into their own later. So maybe they weren't as good as this, some of those other kids at 13, 14, 15, but by 16, 17, 18, 19, like they were like, they, they jumped them in ability. Um, and they had far less uh, issues with like overuse injuries. So I think there's, there's value in it for that reason. Um, but I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule. Like someone like Connor McDavid reportedly is a horrible athlete with anything else. Like, you know, people say you can't really like swing a bat or throw a baseball, but it's arguably the best hockey player on the planet, you know? Um, and I think hockey's kind of an anomaly because you'll see a lot of hockey players that are terrible athletes off the ice. Some of them, some of them get ragged on, but call them bags of milk. <laughs> you got like these horrible bodies. Like Phil Gessel gets knocked like that. They say like Pavel Datsu could barely walk. Like they like, kind, of, kind of walk like a duck, but they're like magicians on the ice. So, I mean, there isn't always this correlation between being a phenomenal athlete in land-based sports to being an awesome hockey player. I think having general athleticism is valuable, but there's so much to say about the specialty of a ho hockey player that some of these guys, they spend all their time doing that, and they may be really weak in the weight room. They may not be able to do one pull-up. You know, Gretzky was notoriously like, like that, you know, um, but yet they're, they're phenomenal on the ice because they've really honed that craft. And if you look at it in the context of the sport mastery, what, what matters most? Right. You know, like if you're not putting in enough time there, you know, we work with a lot of kids. They love working out. They love the weight room. They love getting stronger and bigger, but maybe they don't put in enough time on the ice and maybe they don't see the type of development as a hockey player that they would like, but it's a tough conversation to have. It's like, you know, if, if you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, it's like most hockey players aren't necessarily remembered for how much they squatted or what their weight room numbers are. I mean, you might hear people talk about them in the context of why they're such a special player. Maybe they were strong on the ice, strong on the puck, stuff like that. But it's like, guys, reality is, you know, you got to spend time on the ice if that's where time needs to be spent. Yeah, unless they start implementing uh, squats in, in the uh, per between periods or something. Right, exactly. Stay in limber. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's always it's always dependent upon the person. It's like you got to look at it relative to the level that they're playing at, level like their peers. And, uh, you know, if they're behind, you know, there's it becomes pretty clear where they need to spend time on. And it becomes a tough balance because some kids might need a lot of work on the ice, but you know, they might also need to spend some time getting stronger or getting, you know, improving their range of motion, improving their general coordination and stuff like that off the ice. Cause that'll help them on. So they might have a little bit more on their plate that they have to juggle than, you know, a kid that's like pretty damn good on the ice. And maybe it, he'll just, he's just going to get better because he simply starts working out a little bit. And he's just going to, he's just start going to jump. He's going to start jumping kids, you know, it's yeah. because you see he's that much more gifted. Like it just happens. It's like you watch most youth sports. You go to like, you hear it all the time with like youth soccer. You know, you just see sometimes the natural athletes. You just watch the kids running and chasing the ball. And that's, that's true with hockey too. Yeah. Some kids, it just starts clicking far quicker than others. And whether there's genetic reasons to that or, Maybe they're maybe they're at home doing stuff that we don't even know, yeah. you know, and, and it's just it's translating far quicker for them than it is someone else. Just all right. Well, where do, where do you have to spend your time and how are you going to balance it? Sure. Cool. Yeah. 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 As much information as you could. I think it's important about the like annual plan of it all, especially with the speed. You know, versus yeah. depending on how it is, we have that argument quite a bit with some of our athletes here in our conditioning classes that get run. Like, why do we want to 
our football team to be the most conditioned and as fast as they can be in April. Right. It's not until September. We want you to play in August. Yeah. Up to it. And then, you know, like you said, the adapting, what you're seeing yeah. to the athlete, I think that was a huge point. If, even though you've got them on a table and their ankle range of motion might suck. Yeah. And you put them in that specific situation. Yeah. That's what ultimately counts. So not getting too hung up on those things. Yep. So, you know, it's huge. You bring you bring up an interesting point, Joel, because you know you look at certain sports. You know, football is a great example because when you're building an annual plan for a football team, um, yeah, it can be relatively easy, so to speak, because you know when your competitive season ends. Agreed. Right. So you know you can you can base you know how what you're going to do with the athletes in order to optimize and peak them at the right times. Um, with hockey, I don't know how things are where you guys are in Wisconsin, but for example, you know, the competitive season mostly runs here. Most kids are on the ice by August. Okay. Full practice. They might extend into February or March, depending on how successful the team is by April, at least for triple a sometimes juniors, even high school, April are tryouts. Yeah, it's almost impossible to plan. And then, and then after April, you may have some downtime, but then they might be doing some things with the team, you know, some skates and workouts, May, June, July. So a hockey player, you got to almost keep them in this constant state of readiness. You know, there's a big difference between physical preparation and physical readiness. Like physical readiness flux, fluctuates all day long. You know, I could get you at 8 a.m. for a workout and you could feel like dog crap, but 3 p.m. later that day, you could be ready to set the world on fire. But maybe because of your schedule and whether it's uh, classes or this and that, we may miss an optimal training window, right? And then all that training readiness, um, like that's a, you, almost in a way some guys talk about like, okay, hey, if, if we were to train today and tomorrow and this and that, like, could you come within maybe 90% of your personal best into something, you know? And that's hard to do, you know? It's like it kind of helps you dictate their training load because are you are you overtraining someone? Are you undertraining them? You know, how close are they in their current capacity to their peak performance, so to speak? Because we, we don't get a lot of time to peak guys. You know, like some of our college hockey players, it's a little easier um because you know when they're home in the summer we have some dedicated time but a lot of the youth and amateur kids we work with in the in, in the area they're a lot of times they're in, uh maybe maybe absent of three four weeks during the month the the bulk of the calendar year they're going they're doing stuff um so it is it's it's tough in that sense um to to kind of manage it um, keep them physically prepared, help them feel like there's that level of readiness in their body um, <clears throat> that ultimately is going to help dictate their their performance. You know, so some of them don't make a lot of big jumps when we work with them in a three, four week window. I mean, a lot of our hockey athletes work with us calendar year because they they know and their parents know they don't get a lot of dedicated time like in the like an off season, like some of the other high school athletes get uh, in other sports to really come in, and whereas like our football athletes, we get them basically for the summer, and then come in season, you don't you don't see them at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll see that. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Re re uh, couple these or yeah, we can. So, um. Any new book recommendations? Yeah, I read anything good lately? Oh man, uh, nowadays I'm so busy. I don't do a ton of reading anymore. Like I, I, I try to. I've been doing some interesting research. I like, try to pick up on some. I had a buddy share with me a recent research study about they, they looked at. I mean, this was this was from like '99, I think, but I'd never seen it before about the cervical spine disc anatomy, how it's more crescent shape it doesn't you don't get a full annulus hmm. in 
Yeah, it was in spawn. So it's like you don't you don't like the the model of the disc that they worked out. Like the anatomy from the lumbar spine to the cervical spine completely changes. So where's uh, the opening of the crescent? Yeah. So basically, there's the the posterior. You basically have the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then the, and then the the disc, like the um, the nucleus. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That was pretty interesting read there, and which you know is crazy because, like you know, with exposure I've had to McKenzie stuff like that, I've never heard anyone in McKenzie or certain like you know disc management talk about that anatomy of the disc. And this this was a study from '99 in spine, right? You know, I mean, we're talking about uh, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, where 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 is this? And, and, and it could be completely relevant to clinical management too. So. Um, that was kind of interesting. Lately, I've been really enjoying listening to Joe Rogan. <laughs> um, a lady that he's had on a few times is this woman named Rhonda Patrick. Yep. Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to her a lot. Um, Chris Kresser. Um, I, I mean, I just find that stuff fascinating, you know, because it's not stuff I understand terribly well. But, um, yeah, but from that standpoint, um, yeah, anytime I look around to Patrick and you think you know something, you get firmly set back to reality that you don't know a whole lot. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It's, that it's way, it is brilliant. Yeah, it, it is pretty humbling when you you get you, you start listening to people that you're like, it's really intelligent people out there, you know, yeah. they're in the trenches with stuff. Um, and I always I always enjoy revisiting um, a lot of Stuart McGill stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think he has, uh, you know, I, I feel like the exercise considerations that he makes, you know, as, as much as I love DNS and we've, yeah, I know you guys have done DNS episodes and it's a valuable part of your practices. Um, you know, I love the principles of DNS. And then I think when you take like stuff like McGill's model and stuff like that, especially because, uh, you know, it's one thing to work with someone on the table, but it doesn't always transfer when they're up on their feet and doing stuff. And I think that's one thing about a lot of McGill's fine tuning things is it really transfers well into athleticism. And if you can mesh, mesh those together, um, I mean, that's what we'll do a lot here. I, I mean, I, I think the outcomes are awesome. So, you know, I like to, I, I've been circling back more and more to, uh, McGill stuff and I'll try to listen to little uh, things of his on the internet you know when I can um, but that's kind of been some of the highlights of things I've been digging around in or trying to wrap my head around better have you checked out his new book yet the gift of injury yeah. I haven't I mean you hear really really good stuff about it you know but uh, I'm hoping to get it for Christmas yeah, maybe you'll get it. I asked for it. Yeah, we'll see yeah. if it goes up. Well, if you get it, yeah, I, I mean, I again, I've heard like awesome stuff about it. Um, and it's just, I, I think someone like him that's really worked with some of like some really, really bad backs, but also at the same time worked with some high level athletes. I mean, it's just the background that's, uh, you know, from a performance side and a rehabilitative side, there's always something I pick up from them every time I listen to them talk. Because like we, you know, how we started today's episode is how how do you understand where you're at on that spectrum? Right. How to take someone and in um, he's I feel like in, in a certain context he's he's one of the best to to listen to because he he studied those two populations very very well and for a long time yeah, he's fascinating to listen to but he's also extremely frustrating in that it, everything is well what's the context yeah what, it depends which is fantastic and that give him a lot of credit for that because he's not just trying to do canned answers but it's also like hard to glean anything out of it all the time because you're just like just give me an answer yeah it is and and, and he's always been that way i right. had the opportunity to listen to him, to him speak like at least a handful of times and it's always that way you yeah. know 
I mean, to put that man's train of thinking down on paper, I think would be near impossible. <laughs> you know, um, I think that's the, the frustrating thing about it for a lot of people because um, just to get in a, a sense of or where would you go with this? Like, yeah, he, just, uh, he doesn't really articulate it. No. <laughs> yeah, it's all very, very specific. Like, you would have to come to him with this is the story, this individual. Like, he, I, he doesn't live in the generals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. But no, I think uh, I think that's about – I think those are the big ones there. At least I've been kind of learning or trying to pick up on. So then I think the only like newer question that we have towards the end, since we've had these from you before. Um, so in your area of expertise, and I think we could define that for this one in like training hockey players, how would you take something that is complicated, think a lot of things that we're talking about, and make that as simple as you could? Um, I, I think it's helping them understand that, that anytime – Anytime you're looking to make a substantial change in the human body, it, it comes over a period of time with, with repeated inputs, practice, you know. And so skill acquisition, whether it be off-ice stuff like strength, power, um, you know, increase in someone's like some people call it movement, literacy, efficiency, or on-ice stuff. Um you got to be patient with it, but you got to put in, you got to be put in the work. It's not overly complicated. It's, it's pretty simple, you know, um, like you just, you got to put, you got to give your body that exposure to it. I mean, it's hockey is a highly technical sport um, compared to most things. Like, I mean, you see guys in the NFL that have never really played football, but they're athletic and we can teach you what to do. Right. You don't you don't see anyone in the NHL as much as uh what's the guy's name Ramsey Jalen Ramsey you hear what he said you give give him six months he said give me six months I'll make an NHL team I'll make an NHL roster I hadn't heard that one but I yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it you know they got commentary from NHL guys I mean I mean credit to him and he's athletic but no way I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's not happening. It's too technical of a sport. Um, you you have you have so many different skills that you have to hone between stick handling, shooting, proficiency, forehand, backhand, um, skating. Then there's the reading, you know, the, your visual aspect of the game, timing, spacing, knowledge of the game, you know, strategy, if you will. Um, I mean, and all of that comes from exposure, comes from practice. So, um, literally like when I'm talking with the young kids, it's, it's, it becomes a pretty simple message. Either, either, either you're putting in the time practice or you, you aren't, you know, you gotta get, you gotta get your body exposed to it. There's only one way you're going to get better. You know, sometimes it's a little bit more of a slow cook process than than it is for another kid. But you got to get your hands on your stick and the puck and you got to get on the ice. It's it's pretty much as, as simple as that. I mean, it's like it, it's a it's a complicated game, but it's kind of like it's it's pretty simple. Like you're either you're either practicing your skills or you're not, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's the only way you're going to hone the craft. And if you really want to hone that craft, <clears throat> then you're, you're going to find the time to do it. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way I was with the sport. So it's like, if I feel like if someone's got that, that hunger to them, then it become the, the answer becomes pretty simple. It's just like, you can't keep them away from doing it. Right. That's, yeah. that's it. You know, <laughs> like, it, it's like they get mad if they can't, get to the ice rink or, you know, they didn't get enough time practicing, you know, it bugs them. You know what I mean? Like, so that's, that's probably the best thing I could say in terms of taking something complicated and making it simple.
Definitely. We're playing hockey. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, guys. It's always a uh, time well spent with you. So yeah, we'll do it again in the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this time. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So it's been uh, good talking to you boys as always. Likewise. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for checking out this episode of Clinically Pressed. Go to clinicallypressed.com for full show notes and links to everything that we covered in this episode. While you're there, you'll have full access to all our episodes, insights, and shorts. You can find Clinically Pressed on YouTube or any podcast outlet that you use. If you could give us a rating, thumbs up, or a review on how we're doing, we would greatly appreciate it and heard it helps out quite a bit. To get more free content delivered straight to your inbox, sign up for the Total Athletic Therapy newsletter at totalathletictherapy.com or clinicallypressed.com. You'll get direct links to all the new Clinically Pressed episodes, reviews on some of the latest research in health and performance, and links to related podcasts and other items meant to help you make the complicated, simple, and optimized performance. Thank you for listening, and see you next episode. How much hair do you have tied behind your head now? Oh, man. I haven't even seen it when it's down. It's... Yeah. It's probably down to about there. I don't know. It's it's getting pretty long. Yeah. I'd say you have I, longer hair than your wife. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.